The tea inside of this cup is a sort of three-dimensional solid, but if I just look at the layer of milk foam on the top, that represents a two-dimensional disc. Now, I want you to imagine that I take the milk foam on the top and I mix it around. I'm not doing three-dimensional mixing, I'm just mixing around this top layer of foam on this two-dimensional disc. Now, if I just rotate around in a circle, kind of like spinning a wheel of a car, the point in the very center, it does not change. But what if I did some other crazy mixing, some other function of this two-dimensional disc to the two-dimensional disc, then the remarkable claim of Brouwer's fixed-point theorem is that there is some little bit of milk foam that ends up exactly where it began. And while that was true for the two-dimensional disc, it's also true for the whole three-dimensional solid. If I do a lot of aggressive mixing and transform three-dimensionally, that there is one spot in my cup of tea that remains exactly where it began, or at least exactly within whatever uncertainty of the size of these molecules is going to be. All right, so let's head to the video lab and we can see how we can prove that. So this is the formal statement of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. And I had to tell you a few little pieces of terminology first. And the first is this BN. BN is just the mathematical way we're gonna describe a closed ball of dimension n. So, for example, what we have here, this is B2, the closed ball of dimension 2, and it basically just looks like a disk. A circle, but it's filled in. All of the points where it is less than or equal to 1 in the sum of the squares of the coordinates. And then what we're considering is continuous maps that take this particular ball and it does whatever it wants to the ball. It takes points from the ball to other points in the ball, and the only constraint is continuity. That is, that points that begin close together need to end up close together. So one of these maps is the one that we just talked about where we're gonna go and take this and rotate it around and the point in the middle does not change, but that all of the other points on the ball go to some other point on the ball. Then the claim about Brouwer's fixed point theorem, the claim is that there is a fixed point. There is one x that has the property that f of x is equal to x. So in the case of when we're just rotating it around, it's that point that's right in the middle, but for some other continuous function, it might be some other point. Now, there are many different ways that this theorem can be proven, and I'm gonna choose one that is fairly easy to follow along and is combinatorical in its nature. So to prove this, I first want to show a different theorem, Sperner's Lemma. We're gonna prove Sperner's Lemma, and then from Sperner's Lemma, we're gonna show Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So I want you to consider some triangle here and a sub-triangulation of that larger triangle. A sub-triangulation is just you take the big triangle, you add a bunch of vertices and you connect it so that what you get is a whole bunch of other little triangles. I've done it in a way where all these triangles are regular, the same size, but it doesn't matter. You can put the points anywhere and you can make any sort of combination of triangles that you might wish. Now, all the different vertices that we have in this triangulation, I want to color them. I want to associate some color to all the vertices. Let's do the big final edge points first. So I'm going to put red down here, green up at the top, and blue down on the far right. Now I'm going to try to figure out how do I go and color all the vertices along this edge. And what I want to do is along the edge between the red and between the green, I want to put only red and greens here. So it fills in something like this. Along this edge, reds and greens between the red and the green. Along the bottom, reds and blues between the red and the blue. And along the far right here, greens and blues between the green and the blue. Now, I haven't yet filled in the center here, but I want to note something interesting about what occurs along this edge. Notice how there's some line segments, like this one here, that goes between two different reds. But that the next one, it goes between a red and a green. I want to look at those. I want to look at these little edge segments that go between two different colors. I don't care about the red to red. I'm interested in the red to green. So here we have one red to green here. Uh, then it's a green to green, don't care. Then a green to red, I care about that one. And red to green, I care about that one. So I've got three along this edge which have alternating colors on each of these little line segments. Three is an odd number. And my claim here is that that always has to occur. It always has to be that there's an odd number of these red-green edges. Why is that true? First of all, I want you to think, well, it starts at red, 
and it ends up at green. So there has to be at least one of them, right? Maybe it's red, 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 but eventually it has to have one that goes to green. So there's at least one. However, let me imagine that I change the colors of these a little bit. So first of all, let me imagine this red one down here I changed to a green. You notice that I've got this red-green edge, and if I change that to a green, it would just shift it over by one. Well, shifting where the red-green edge occurs, that doesn't change the number of them. So if I change this one, it would just shift it over. Okay, what about this one up here where I've got this red dot? Well, if I change that red dot to a green dot, then there'd be two different segments that were originally counted as red-green edges, and now we just go green, 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 and you would remove two. Or likewise down in the bottom here where it goes red, 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 if I made that red blue, it would add two. So here's our argument. There has to be at least one, and then if I make changes, I can either shift, which doesn't add anything, or I can replace, which either adds or subtracts two. So I start with an odd number, and I either add or subtract two from it, I'm gonna end up with an odd number. So I claim an odd number of red-green edges. And likewise, there's gonna be an odd number of these blue-green edges on the one side, and an odd number of the blue-red edges along the bottom. So we got all these odd numbers. All right, so that was figuring out how we're gonna associate the, the far outside vertices. We figured out all these edge vertices. What about the middle? The middle, do whatever you want. As long as they're red, green, and blue, you can fill them in however you like. I don't really mind. Now, I want you to notice something. If, if I stop thinking about edges now, I want to think about all these little triangles that are going along here. There's a few of these little triangles that are special. They're special if you've got a triangle that has all three colors of its vertices. So for example, this one right here, green, red, blue. It's got all three colors for that particular little triangle. And in fact, there's actually three of them. There's one here, there's another one there, and there's one down there that have all three colors. Those are special. Okay, so what does Berners Lemma even say? I haven't even told you what it says yet. Well, it says this. If you color the triangulation via the rules I told you, three different colors for the big three outside vertices, you have to match the colors along the three edges and you can do whatever you want in the middle. If you obey those rules, then there has to be at least one of these little triangles that has all three colors. Okay, so how do we prove that? I'm claiming that there has to be one. In this case, we happen to have three of them. I'm claiming there has to be one of them. How can we show that? I'm gonna go and take my pen, and I'm gonna draw a pass that go through this particular triangulation. Here's the rule for how I'm gonna draw a path. My path is going to begin at one of those edges that's going to have two different colors. So for example, I might want to start right up here. And then the rule is I'm allowed to go through this triangulation as long as I always go through edges of the same color. So for example, if I come through here, I've gone through the red-green edge. And then I'm gonna keep on going down. There's another red-green edge I can pass through it, another red-green edge I can pass through it, and then a red-green edge and I'm out. So I've come along in and I've gone all the way around and I've got out by only going through red-green edges. Okay, how else can I do it? I, I could do the same thing in reverse. Coming in through red-green edges, coming in, coming in, coming in, and I would leave out. So this sort of one goes both directions. Okay, how else could I do it? Well, I could come in through this red-green edge, I could come in through this red-green edge, and then I have a problem. As soon as I get into that triangle with all three colors, I can't get out because they've got all three colors, so there's only one red-green edge. So I go in and there's no exit for me. Or I could turn around and I would just go right out the same way, but, but either way, it would only take up one of these edges. Oh, there's several more of them we can figure out. Okay, we've got this uh, green-blue edge. I can come in green-blue, 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 and then I come in and I get stuck. I come down over here and I'm gonna have green-blue, Green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, and then I'm gonna get stuck. What else do we have? I guess down here, green, blue, green, blue, I get stuck. And I got one more, I can come right up the bottom here and I immediately get stuck. All right, so what have we seen? We've seen there's two ways that things can occur. One is I come in and I go out and that takes up a total of two of these edges. I come in and I go out at a different spot. The other possibility is I go in and I get stuck. So now let's go back to our original claim that there's an odd number of edges here. Well, there's an odd number of edges along here and there's two possibilities. I can go in and go out, which takes up an even number. There might be a whole bunch of these. Or 
I can come in and I can get stuck. But that tells me that there has to be a spot where I come in and get stuck on one of these big highlighted yellow triangles because if there's an odd number and the ones that go in and go out are always even numbers, there's got to be at least one that comes in and gets stuck. So this is our claim, this is our proof of Sperner's lemma that indeed there must be one of these yellow triangles that has all three different colors. Now, I did this in the two-dimensional case, but this does generalize. Here, I've given the sort of three-dimensional analog where now you have a tetrahedron with four different points and four colors, and I will leave the proof of the generalization to you. It's an induction proof, but you can imagine that, for example, on this edge here, we've got the green, blue, red edge, and you can try to think about how do I deal with now little tetrahedrons opposed to little triangles. I'll leave that proof for you. Now, We've got Sperner's lemma. We've shown this combinatorically. I haven't used any high-level math here. We've just sort of drawn some pictures and taken paths, and we've got this really nice claim. So now let's try to return to Brouwer's fixed-point theorem. We want to use the proof of Sperner's lemma to prove it. The first thing I want to do is, uh, this is a visualization of Brouwer's fixed-point theorem. Okay, so I've, I've got some disk. This is a two-dimensional disk. I could take some function. Here's the rotation one, right? Rotates it around, and we've got that fixed point right in the middle. Now, one other thing I could do is I'm going to take this disk, I'm going to sort of flatten it down into being a triangle. All right, so I take the, take the disk, I flatten it down. I'm then going to rotate within this triangle. So I'm going to rotate everything around. Uh, now rotation means follow a little triangle opposed to follow a little circle, but it's a rotation nonetheless. And then I'm going to go and blow it up again. So we return back to our original disk. So what I've done here is that I've effectively argued that rotation of the circle is sort of the same thing as compress to a triangle, rotate in the triangle, and spread out back to the full disk again. And indeed, this compression map that takes a disk and turns it into a triangle, this is a continuous map, and it's an invertible map in the sense that two points are going to, that are close together, end up close together when you do this triangle compression map. And it's invertible in the sense that if I tell you where the points are going to go end up, you can tell me where they began as well. So my big claim here is that when I want to go and prove Brouwer's fixed point theorem, which was stated as maps between balls from BN to BN, I can just put in triangles there just the same and it's going to work exactly the same way. I can look at continuous maps from a triangle to a triangle. Now triangles look a little bit closer. If I want to use Sperner's lemma to prove it, let's see how we can do that. I'm going to look at a triangle, but I'm going to look at a very specific triangle, a very specifically oriented one. This, this triangle in three-dimensional space where it's got one vertex at the point 1, 0, 0, another at 0, 0, 1, and a third at 0, 1, 0. So I have this very sort of specific triangle. This, by the way, is called the two-simplex. It's defined in this way, and the, the only real property that I care about is that if you're on that triangle, that specific triangle, then you have to have this property that x plus y plus z is 1. The sum of the coordinates is equal to 1. That's the definition of this triangle. And I'm orienting this theorem in the context of this specific triangle so that I can use the rigidity of the way it is oriented. I can use this formula in the proof of this little theorem. All right, so how do, how do I make Sperner's lemma with something about triangles fit in this particular context? The idea is first this. Brouwer's fixed point theorem looks at how I can go and take points here and transform them to other points. So for example, if I have some p in the triangle, what is f of p, where f of p is this continuous function applied to p? Now, what I want to do is I want to color code all of the points in this triangle, and I'm going to color code them by a certain set of rules. And my rules are going to be this. First, if f of p strictly decreases in the x direction, I'm going to color it red. If it strictly decreases in the y direction, we're going to color it blue. If it strictly decreases in the z direction, we're going to color it green. So all the different points here could be color coded red, blue, or green, just kind of like we had with Sperner's lemma. Uh, let's consider the big outside vertices first. Well, if I look at this one here, there's only one of two possibilities. Either f of p doesn't change it, in which case I'm done, I've proven my theorem, f of p is equal to p. Or if it does change it, because this is at the maximal, the x equal to 1, it has to decrease the value of x, that's why I color it red. Likewise for green and likewise for blue. So now that I got my triangle, starting to look a little bit like Sperner's lemma, let's try a triangulation of it, so I'll go and divide it up however I wish. 
Now, I want to color code all the different vertices on this triangle, but, but let's look at this left edge first. On this edge, y is zero. So I can never decrease it. I can never color it blue because y is already zero. So along this edge, it's only red and greens. Along this edge, only red and blues. And on the far side, it's only green and blues. So this applies the conditions of Sperner's lemma. This triangulation has to be color coded according to Sperner's lemma. And what does that tell me? It tells me that there is somewhere, somewhere, a yellow triangle, a sub-triangle in the triangulation that has all three colors. Okay, let me keep going. I've got that. Let me now go and sub-triangulate again. So I took my triangulation, I made a finer triangulation with little smaller ones. Well, Sperner's lemma still applies. It still gives me a particular sub-triangle, but now it's that smaller one. There's no guarantee that this smaller one is ever related to the larger one. It's just somewhere on here, there's gotta be another one. I can keep on going and keep on going. Smaller triangulations and smaller triangulations. And indeed, I'm gonna get the sequence of little triangles that get smaller and smaller and smaller and bounce all around my big triangle. Let me just focus on the red points. So what I get in effect is a sequence of red points. I've drawn a finite number of them, but it's an infinite sequence. I can keep on sub-triangulating. I get a new little triangle. I figure out where the red point is. I can keep on doing that. Or I could do it for the greens or I could do it for the blues. It doesn't really matter. But nonetheless, I'm going to get this infinite sequence of red points, an infinite sequence of green points, and an infinite sequence of blue points. Now, I have to say a few points about this. The first is this. Every sequence has a convergent subsequence due to this very powerful theorem in mathematics called balzano weierstrass theorem. The idea is this. My triangle is a finite space. I've got infinitely many points. They're bouncing all around this particular triangle. There's no order to it, but because there's infinitely many, there must be somewhere on the triangle where the points start getting accumulated there, where infinitely many of them get close to some spot. Because it's an infinite number being squeezed in this finite space, I, I can't escape this fact. So somewhere over here of this infinite sequence, we have what we call a convergent subsequence, where if I just choose some collection of this infinite sequence, an infinite collection of this infinite sequence, then those points are going to be getting arbitrarily close to some other spot. So that's the first point. There's some red point where the sequence is getting close to that, same for the greens, same for the blues. Further, as we sub-triangulate and sub-triangulate, the, the three different colors keep on getting closer and closer and closer as I get smaller and smaller triangles. So this point where you've got the reds converging to it also has the greens converging to it, also has the blues converging to it. As in, there is some point where it is decreasing. Decreasing was our condition to define the red, the blue, and the green. It's decreasing in all three of the directions. By the way, note that in our original definition, we said strictly decreasing as in not equal, but the way that convergent sequences work, the point it's converging to could be on the boundary, and so this it's possible it's decreasing or equal in all directions. And then finally, if it's decreasing or equal, it's not possible to decrease in all three directions at once. Remember that original equation, the x plus y plus z is equal to one? It can't be that x and y and z are all decreasing. So the only possibility is that x and y and z, that they do not change. In other words, it is fixed in all directions. And so what do we have? We have a fixed point. We have said that there must be some spot. I don't know where it is, but I know that it must exist where f of p is p. In other words, that this continuous function is fixing the point. So that is the proof of Brouwer's fixed point theorem from Sperner's lemma.